We're hearing a lot these days about the impact of automation on jobs. For instance, office clerks, receptionists, customer service reps, doctors, lawyers, even creatives could be replaced by artificial intelligence in the next few decades. And according to the World Economic Forum, women may stand to lose the majority of jobs. It says in America alone, by 2026, 1.4 million positions will either be automated or disrupted by automation in some way. 57% of those jobs belonging to women, something they say could widen gender inequality. But all may not be lost, since a person's ability to survive the shake-up depends greatly on whether she can acquire new skills. Emma Martino Truswell advises governments and other bodies on the rise of artificial intelligence and joins me now from London. Emma, thanks for being with us. So are we right to be scared? I think it's helpful for us to be a little bit scared because I think fear makes people act and makes people think differently. And I think there's a lot to be a little bit nervous about in terms of what these kinds of changes are going to mean for individuals at work and what that's going to mean for those individuals as their jobs change and as they need to find new jobs. So they're human things to be worried about rather than technical things. But do you believe women stand to lose more than men? I think in the short term, it is a lot of women's jobs that seem to be particularly under threat from disruption. Something that I think is really important is that what is being automated is not a job per se, it's particular tasks as part of a job. And the kinds of things that are coming through in the next few years mean that the sorts of tasks that women tend to do as part of their work are some of the things that are likely to be automated quite quickly. What's really interesting, though, is that when we look in the longer term at what kinds of tasks and what kinds of jobs are likely to be affected, actually a lot of the jobs are ones that are traditional male jobs. So things like jobs in manufacturing, in transportation, in construction are likely to be more affected when we look sort of 20 to 30 years in the future. But is it not the case that the very such qualities that we normally associate with women, such as emotional intelligence, empathy, etc., cannot be replicated by robots or by artificial intelligence per se? Yeah, ab absolutely. So one of the things that I think is interesting in looking at what kinds of tasks are going to be automated and, and which ones are going to remain really important in the workplace is to look at what can a machine be good at and what can a person be good at? And in this case, what, what are women good at? Machines are good at tasks that are repetitive. They're good at calculating large numbers of data, large numbers of inputs very, very quickly and efficiently. They're good at predicting things based on things that have happened before. But they're not very good at things like communicating, things like bringing people together, caring roles. These are things that require skills that I think both women and men have but traditionally women have been better at these kinds of tasks. Is there not a problem, however, Emma, that given the low representation of women in STEM careers at the moment, that artificial intelligence is already skewed in its gender bias? You know, the fact that we've got people probably writing the codes as we speak are likely to be men. Yeah, I think that is pretty worrying and I think it's really important that women, especially women who might tend to be interested in these kinds of things, interested in talking about and thinking about technology, don't see jobs like coding as things that only need to be done by nerdy white men. I think the more women who are coding and who are learning about artificial intelligence, the better. But I also think it's important that women know that you don't have to be a coder to work in tech or to think and talk about technology. So many of the issues that are going to be coming up in the next couple of decades are much more about the human transition to the use of machines than they are just about the design of machines. So to me there are two things that are really important. One is to get as many women coding as possible and that's something that uh, a lot of people in a lot of countries are already working on. And second, to encourage women to do the kinds of roles that are going to be needed alongside technology. So how do you advise governments and companies alike on how they need to prepare for the rise of artificial intelligence? Well, I think for a government, especially a government thinking about what it means for the workplace, there are a few things that are really important. 
One is to look at what kind of training and retraining is available for people, especially training that might be on the job or the sorts of things that people are doing alongside the work that they're already doing, because I don't think we can assume that the private sector will necessarily provide all that's needed or that the people who need it most will be able to afford it. The second thing is for governments to look at what happens when a man or a woman is suddenly out of a job. And as we've said, uh, a lot of these in the next few years may be women, uh, it's office workers and certain forms of secretarial work that we think are most at risk at the moment. And the third question is, do governments want to slow this down? Because something that I think is important is that the WEF report and many of the other pieces of research that have looked into these kinds of questions assume that government is not going to be getting involved too much. But actually, a lot of these are decisions that we should be making as a society and that our governments might be helping us with. So, for example, part of the reason why there are a couple of pilots in a plane is not because they're needed at any one time, but because we've made the decision that we want there to be humans helping to fly our planes, even when there are machines doing a lot of the work. In the same way, we might decide, for example, that we don't want a classroom to be 50 kids all on different tablets, supervised by some kind of surveillance system. We might want there to be human teachers in there with our kids. And that's the kind of decision that a government can make and that will, of course, have enormous consequences on what kinds of job losses we see over the next few decades. Emma, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Annette.